So next, uh, Dr. Susan O'Brien will address the next questions in chronic lymphocytic leukemia. Hello, everyone. Here are my disclosures. So the first question I wanted to ask is, do we really need antibodies with small molecule combinations? Um, so let me show you some data. Uh, this is the data from MD Anderson. This is the only data that's actually published using a combination of ibrutinib and venetoclax. And this is actually a trial that was designed for high-risk patients. So 92% of these patients are unmutated, 17P deleted, or 11Q deleted. And the trial was designed with a three-month lead-in of ibrutinib to debulk and then combined uh, ibrutinib venetoclax. And you can see that the best response when Nit and Jane updated this at ASH uh, uh, 2020 was 75% with bone marrow MRD undetectability. Pretty, pretty impressive, especially in a high-risk group. And here's the progression for an overall survival, which I think is quite, quite impressive to say the least. We also have the Captivate data. So this is a, a trial where um, it's a better population in that it's all comers, but younger patients. So everybody had to be under 70. Uh, there's a variety of cohorts uh, MRD-based therapy after 15 cycles or fixed duration. But note that all of these patients, no matter what the cohort, get a uh, three-month lead-in of ibrutinib, just like I said uh, the design was in the MD Anderson trial. And then they look at the response after 12 cycles of the combination. Here's the data from the MRD group. And you can see that the best MRD response in the bone marrow was 72% undetectable. So very similar to what I just showed you for MD Anderson, even though a, a somewhat different population. So now let's look at a trial where we actually have two small molecules and an antibody. And this is a trial from Dana Farber that Matt Davids presented at ASH last year. And this is using a combination of acalabrutinib, obinutuzumab, and venetoclax. Note again, the lead-in with obin and acala, and then the three-drug combination. And note that the primary endpoint here is at the end of 15 cycles or 12 cycles of combination therapy. And what we see in the left-hand uh, bar graph is the bone marrow undetectability after that 15 cycles in the dark blue, and that's 76%. So this really doesn't look very different from what I just showed you for, for ibrutinib and venetoclax alone in two other trials. Well, where are we heading? Where we're heading is that uh, there's a myriad of trials, all of which are looking at small molecule combinations, um, but are any of them comparing with or without antibody? Well, there actually is one trial, ACE CLL311, which is randomizing upfront patients to either FCR, BR, depending on their age, or a calibrutinib and ben, or a calibrutinib and ben and obinutuzumab. However, what I don't know is whether this is actually powered to compare the two ACAL arms. And my guess is, based on the number of patients, that it probably is not. So how do we get a timely answer to whether antibodies will add to the small molecules? I think one way we might be able to do that is by using deeper levels of MRD and assessments. So all of the data that I showed you so far is using a, a level of 10 to the minus fourth, which is pretty standard. But we now have techniques that can measure 10 to the minus fifth, 10 to the minus sixth. So for example, what if when we look at a deeper level, the three drug combination showed many, many more patients who were MRD undetectable at 10 to the six. To me, that would be an early readout that would suggest that maybe the antibody is adding something. So until we look at deeper levels, I think it'll be hard to tell and it'll take a really long time with really large trials. My second question is, can small molecule therapy cure anyone? We certainly know that chemotherapy can. Uh, although that is pretty much limited only to FCR, where we see this long-term plateau, you see the German data on the left, the Italian data on the right, and the MD Anderson data, which has the longest follow-up. Um, now, albeit that cure fraction is limited to generally fit younger patients because they're the ones who can tolerate FCR and limited to patients who are mutated. So not the majority of patients with CLL, but a significant minority, especially if this is a younger group where you're most wanting to have a cure fraction. Well, let's go back for one second, and we don't have any data for any small molecules, obviously, that goes out this far. But what if we look at the four-year data, and you'll see why I'm choosing that. We see that with FCR at four years, the PFS and the mutated was about uh, 85%. So we have the combination of venetoclax and obinutuzumab. This is not two small molecules, but it's combination therapy 
without chemotherapy and it's fixed duration. It's a little more analogous to chemotherapy in that setting. So in this frontline trial, the, median, the uh, therapy was given for one year and we recently at EHA had four year follow-up. We see that there's still no median PFS with venobinutuzumab and the four year progression free survival rate is 74% which is pretty impressive because now remember, this is three years off therapy. Well, if we really want to compare apples to apples, we should be looking at the mutated population. So here we have the breakout by the mutated. And if again, if we go up uh, from 48 months to the mutated population, we're up at a PFS of about 90%. So this is at least as good, if not better than FCR at the same time point. Well, what about small molecules? I come back to Nitin's data because again, that's the one that has the longest follow-up. And if we look at 48 months, we're up at 95%. And again, if we look at the mutated, uh, we're at 100% PFS. Now, at, this is a very tiny number. It's only 13 because again, this trial was designed for high-risk patients. But nevertheless, even if you want to look at the mutated, we're up around 90, unmutated, we're up around 95%. So this is again, better than FCR at that time point. But of course, the obvious question that we, is begged to be asked here is, is there going to be any plateau on the curve? And it will take significantly longer follow-up to be able to know that. My third and last question is, will small molecule combinations produce better results than sequencing small molecules? So let's look at what we can get with sequencing. If we start with ibrutinib, and I could easily start with uh, venetoclax and go the other way, but there's more long-term data for starting with ibrutinib and then moving to venetoclax. So we just got at ASCO uh, the seven-year follow-up on the Resonate 2 trial comparing ibrutinib to chlorambucil, and we see that at the seven-year time point, we still don't have a median PFS in the ibrutinib arm. So incredibly durable remissions, and at 6.5 years, the progression-free survival is 61%. So we don't have a median yet, but I'm just going to kind of guess or extrapolate that curve. And I'm going to say that this, the median is going to be about eight years. So that's eight years with a small molecule therapy, single agent. So what do I want to do if my patient progresses on ibrutinib? I want to move to venetoclax. Now, what is the data for venetoclax following ibrutinib? There, there's very little but we do have data for venetoclax-based therapy in patients with one prior regimen. So that's the Murano trial where we have, again, two years of fixed duration therapy of then R. As I said, the median number of prior regimens was one, although all of those patients, that regimen was chemotherapy. So arguably this is, might even be better with just a small molecule, but it might not. But let's take the, the median progression-free survival now in this population is 53.5 months, so about four and a half years. So now I add my eight years with ibrutinib to my four and a half years with Ben, I'm at 12 and a half years. Oh, but that may not be it. Why? Because with fixed duration therapy, the idea is that you could come back and use the drug again uh, when the patient relapses. And there is some limited data from this uh, that we had from ASH last year, retreatment in patients that were on Murano. If you look at that left-hand bar graph there, that is patients who have been on the Murano trial subsequently progressed and were retreated with Ben. So you, you note that the number is small, although this number will get bigger as time goes on, but the overall response rate in that population was 72%, really quite good, particularly if you realize that these patients are the early relapsers on the trial and they're very high risk patients and they're enriched for 17P and P53 deletion. So now I'm at 12 and a half years plus whatever I get from retreatment. We don't have a duration of therapy here because the follow-up is too short, but maybe I'm out 13, 14 years. So is, is, is combination therapy going to beat that? Well, again, I come back to Nitin's data because this is the longest follow-up we have with a small molecule combination and we're at 95% out at four years. That is pretty impressive. That suggests it's going to take years to get to a median and just like I showed you in the, in the sequencing, we should be able to retreat these people, we would hope, uh, with either ibrutinib then or the combination because they will have long remissions and relapse off therapy. So we hopefully will not be driving a resistant clone. So I, I, I don't know the answer to this, but I think it's possible um, that we will do uh, even better with combinations. So here's a summary of my questions. And what I'm gonna do now, just go out on a limb and hazard a guess to what I think the answer is gonna be. And maybe in five years, we can come back and, and look and see if this I was correct. So do we really need an antibody with small molecule combinations? I think so. 
Why do I say that? Because if you remember in the CLL14 trial, chlorambucillin or binutuzumab population had a, about a third of the patients who were MRD negative. If you could take a dog of a drug like chlorambucil, add an antibody and get a third MRD negative, that's a really potent antibody and I think it will make a difference. Can small molecule therapy cure anyone? I'm gonna say yes, based on those high MRD rates and my suspicion that some of those people are undetectable at 10 to the fifth or 10 to the sixth. Will small molecule combinations produce better results in sequencing? I'm gonna say yes. And the reason I'm gonna say that is let's face it, we're clinical researchers. What we're really interested in doing is curing the disease. And I'm pretty certain that we're not gonna cure the disease sequencing small molecules. So I'm gonna put my faith in combinations here. Thanks for your attention.